General Gasly's relieving army had approached the walls of Peking on the 19th of August 1900, exhausted and with many casualties. They had heard firing in the distance, and people were still evidently resisting inside the legation quarter. After a day's delay caused by the Russians reorganizing themselves, a plan was made. General Gasly had received a map drawn by MacDonald from one of his agents that detailed the legation quarter's defences and also the best routes into the city. Gasly chose not to share the last part of this information with his allies. Peking's defences consisted of several walls, with cities within cities like a Russian doll. The outermost defence was the city wall that ran around 20 miles around Peking. It was studded with 16 huge gates. Inside this was the Tartar Wall, enclosing the imperial city, 40 feet high and 40 feet wide at the top, and already the scene of much fighting during the siege. The legations nestled between the Tartar Wall and the wall of the Forbidden City, the Great Within. The Allies decided to split up and smash their way into the city through four of the outermost gates located on the east side. The Russians would assault the most northern of those gates, called the Dongja men. The Japanese would take the next gate south, the Chaoyang men, the Americans the next one, the Dongbei men, and finally the British Indian forces, the most southerly one, called the Guangchi men. The entire assault was treated as a race. Whichever national contingent relieved the legations first would win immortality. The Russians decided that they needed a head start, so ignoring the agreed plan, they assaulted the American target gate, the Dongbei men, at 3.30am on the 14th of August, killing 30 Chinese soldiers outside the fortification before blowing in the great red doors with an artillery gun. Russian troops poured in, only to find themselves stuck between the outer gate and another inner gate. The Chinese poured fire down onto the Russians. The Russians were pinned down for hours. 26 Russians died at this gate, and a further 102 were wounded. With the Russians having seized the Americans' target gate, the US troops moved 200 yards south along the enormous wall. Trumpeter Calvin Titus bravely volunteered to scale the wall. He made it unscathed, and several other American soldiers clambered up the 40-foot face. At 11.03 a.m., the Stars and Stripes was flying from atop the outer city wall, accompanied by much cheering and whooping from below. Under fire, American troops clambered down the other side of the wall and headed west towards the legations. The Japanese met stiff resistance at their gate, including coming under Chinese artillery fire. The British knew of a better way into the Imperial City. British troops also saw a Royal Navy sailor standing atop a huge wall in the far distance, signalling to them using semaphore flags. Come in by the water gate. MacDonald had already informed Gasly that the quickest way through would be via the water gate, a drainage canal leading under the enormous wall. Seventy Indian sepoys, the 7th Duke of Connaught's own Rajput regiment, followed their British officers, including General Gasly, who led very much from the front, through the sewage, mud and stinking sludge in the canal, despite coming under sporadic rifle fire from the Hatter men to their right, and arrived inside the Imperial City unscathed. They moved quickly into the legation quarter, and promptly lifted the 55-day siege at 2.30pm, being greeted by hysterically happy civilians and legation guards. A few shots were fired at them by Gansu troops, who then fled. British casualties amounted to one man dead from sunstroke. The Americans arrived at 4.30pm after skirmishing with various Chinese strongpoints during their drive through to the legation quarter. One man had been killed and nine wounded. The Japanese and Russians were relieved later in the day. The following day, Japanese and French troops relieved the stubborn defenders of the Beitang Cathedral. The defence of the legations and Beitang had cost the legation guards 64 killed and 156 wounded. Foreign civilian casualties were 12 dead and 23 wounded. About a thousand Chinese Christians had also perished during the siege. If the victorious powers thought that they would have an opportunity to punish the Dowager Empress, they were to be disappointed. She, along with the Emperor, and a select few of her court, slipped out of the Forbidden City, disguised as peasants, in three wooden wagons on the morning of the next day, the 15th. 
Cixi Xi had fled to Shanxi for what remaining Chinese officials euphemistically labelled a tour of inspection. General Ronglu was left behind to negotiate the peace terms with Gasly and the Allied powers. In the meantime, Peking was thoroughly looted by the victorious Western troops. Palaces were stripped of their valuables, public auctions were held, and a steady and profitable business done in jade, ceramics, jewellery, and artworks, a good proportion ending up in famous Western museums, where it remains on display to this day, much to China's chagrin. One journalist described the Allied army as, quote, the biggest looting expedition since Pizarro, unquote. Peking, like Berlin, 45 years later, was an occupied city divided into national sectors. A peace agreement known as the Boxer Protocols was signed on the 7th of September 1901. China was forced to pay an indemnity to the eight great powers, amounting to $335 million, plus interest, over a 39-year period. The protocols stipulated that all officials who had supported the boxers be executed or exiled. One high-ranking victim was General Dong Fuxiang, who was sent into exile, and China's northern fortifications pulled down. With peace terms agreed, the palaces stripped of their valuables, a victory parade was held in the Forbidden City just to make the point before the imperial court. Then, on the 17th of September 1901, the Allied army left Peking, except for legation guard units, and returned to the coast. The boxer's legacy was British guard battalions at Tianjin and Shanghai, plus a reinforced company at Peking until 1940. The U.S. followed suit by stationing the North China Marines permanently at Tianjin and Peking. The gunboats of the Great Powers regularly patrolled the Yangtze River until 1941. The Qing dynasty had been fatally weakened by its support for the Boxers and entered a rapid decline over the coming years. Dowager Empress Cixi returned from exile on the 7th of January 1902 to live in the Forbidden City. She died there in 1908. The day after the imprisoned emperor, her nephew Guangxu, also died in mysterious circumstances. China's new son of heaven was a three-year-old named Puyi. In 1911, a revolution transformed China from a feudal absolute monarchy into a republic, and Puyi, by then age six, abdicated the following year. The last emperor was allowed to live in the Forbidden City until 1924, a monarch without a country, until rudely ejected by a warlord who had taken control of Peking. So the Qing dynasty passed into history, replaced by warlordism, dictatorship, and eventually foreign invasion and civil war. A major contributory factor in its demise was Cixi's support for the boxers. Sir Claude MacDonald's inspirational leadership during the siege won him promotion to ambassador to Japan, and he died there in 1915. General Gasly was promoted and appointed Knight Grand Commander of the Order of the Indian Empire in 1901. He died in England in 1918. Captain Halliday, who had won a Victoria Cross in a Peking back alley during the most desperate moments of the siege, ended his career as a full general. Sir Edward Seymour, far from suffering for the mistakes made on his first relief expedition, ended up as an admiral of the fleet. John Jellicoe, Seymour's able subordinate, who had been shot in the head during the relief, went on to command the fleet at the Battle of Jutland in 1916. Lieutenant Roger Keyes, who commanded HMS Fame during the boarding of the Chinese destroyers at the Dagu forts, would later become chief of combined operations during the Second World War. The relief of Peking was one of the first examples of a multinational military expedition, and although there were internal differences and rivalries, the alliance held and the army achieved its objectives. Much of the reason for the operation's success can be attributed to the strong and diplomatic leadership displayed by General Gasly. Unfortunately, within 13 years, many of the Allies who saved the Peking legations would find themselves gearing up for the First World War on opposite sides. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my video channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. Thank you.